the Netherlands is in India. That's uh, Solomon Energy Intensity, or in this case, maybe the Shell Energy Intensity Index, where the typical old Indian refineries are somewhere around 100, lower the index, lower the energy consumption per unit of output. The Asian PS are there, the European, the best Europeans are here, the best uh, Americans are here, and Reliance is down there, this Reliance Petroleum. It's the world's most efficient and the largest refinery, 1.2 million barrels per day, and it uses significantly less energy per unit of output than their competitors. And the outputs are very similar, ethylene and, and a whole bunch of other things that, uh, that the refineries produce. And uh, this is the same chart on a, on a different scale. That's Reliance in terms of its energy efficiency index, somewhere around 70. And look at where the variation is, 70 to almost 200. Why can't every refinery be as efficient as out here? So every time Exxon says they are doing great for uh, reducing energy consumption, ask them why they're not as good as Reliance. Let's look at the, does it save dollars when you become more efficient? 59% of the cost of running a refinery is the energy that they use. Would it not save them money at $100 a barrel to, uh, if they could uh, do that? And look at what happened to the Reliance's operating cost compared to Indian peers in the new refinery. I, I don't know what the units are, they're probably rupees per something or the other. And, uh, and uh, they're significantly more efficient and they're saved. So does it surprise you that the market cap of Reliance Industries is $100 billion? Dollars, not rupees. And Mr. Ambani, the chairman, is now worth $50 billion, the second richest man in the world? Well, if you keep building refineries like that, you will. Another classic example, of course, is our automobiles. Look at what happened to energy efficiency, how many liters per 100 kilometers driven as a function of year in different countries. That's the United States and that's Europe. And we came down significantly from 1970 to 1980 because the cars became from V8 to V4 and uh, the car weight went down by almost 1,000 pounds and the old gas guzzlers disappeared. But now it's beginning to increase. But the Japanese are already targeting for significantly lower uh, by 2010, lower uh, gasoline consumptions, almost uh, six uh, liters per 100 kilometers compared to where we are. And everybody knows about the Prius. What do you think the most popular car in the world is? In other words, the consumers who already own the car, you know, the surveys are taken, which car will you buy again? 92% of Prius owners will buy a Prius again. It's by far the highest satisfaction rate. 86% of consumers of Toyota Camry hybrid will buy a hybrid, a Cam Camry hybrid again. Would 86% of uh, Chevrolet Impala buyers buy it again? No, they're in the 50% range. So consumers are buying it. My sister-in-law is on a third price. She turns one in every three years. When it goes out of warranty, she turns it in, takes a new one. She loves it. Let's look at the trends in new car fuel uh, intensity. Again, that's the United States, the red curve. And uh, it's a curve similar to the previous one. Look at what's happening to Germany. Germany has been dropping. And Germany is less than half of, uh, or almost half of what the United States intensity is. So indeed, there is a lot of room for improving the efficiency of automobiles. Not by doing something revolutionary by building cars like Camry Hybrid or Prius. Or if you like SUVs, what's wrong with the Highlander? Highlander Hybrid. If every car or SUV was made a hybrid, we would reduce fuel consumption instantly by 50%. If all of the United States arable land was used to produce ethanol, we would reduce gasoline by 35%, just compare. This can be done within five years. How do we get there? By taxing expected gas consumption at the time of purchase. The consumers may resent a gasoline tax, but they may not resent 
a tax which is put on the manufacturer because he or she makes a bad car. That's simply factored into the cost of the car that you buy. And the do differential taxes work? Yes, look at Denmark. This is what they charge, this, they charge directly to the owners, this is what they charge in terms of euros, how much tax they will charge if your uh, gas mileage is five kilometers per liter, you'll have to pay 2,000 Danish kroners. And uh, if on the other end you're petty, uh, you are getting more than 20 kilometers per liter, you don't pay any tax. Will the scheme not work? Of course it'll work. You can either do it on the consumer or you can do it on the manufacturer. You don't on the manufacturer, the consumer doesn't see it. He sees it, but he really doesn't see it. It shifts the market. So conclusions on efficiency, the opportunities for increasing energy efficiencies are huge, at least a 30 to 50% reduction in energy use possible per dollars of GDP. Much more so in places like India and, and China because they're not using the most efficient technology. Not by a long shot, even the reliance is exceptional, but that's not true for most Indian companies. And they need to implement the best technologies, both government regulation and tax policy are needed but not subsidies, I completely agree with John, not subsidies, as also new technologies. Now since I've been giving kudos to India, I should also kick them when they deserve it. And uh, India recently announced a nano car, $2,500 cost. That's a wonderful idea because it's going to uh, save a lot of lives because it's replacing scooters. And it's not unusual to see husband, wife, and two little children on the scooter. And every time I, I see that, I want to close my eyes because that's a, that's a death waiting to happen. And poor children get killed. So this car is supposed to replace the scooters, uh, which are the normal mode of transportation in urban India. But that's not a hybrid. It's going to be a disaster for India's pollution. All you have to do is go to Bombay and Delhi. And you, almost it's impossible to breathe in parts of Bombay and Delhi or Bangalore. And, uh, and the gas consumption. Most of the traffic in Indian cities is stop and go. Christ, it takes you to go 20 miles, takes you an hour and a half or two hours. That's just stop and go. All you do is accelerate and brake, accelerate and brake. And that's a perfect for hybrid, and this guy didn't do it. I don't know why. Now here is a very, my favorite slide. This is a slide which shows carbon emissions per capita versus domestic product per capita. In general, yes, the higher the GDP, higher the carbon emission or the energy use. But look at the difference, this is a log scale. It goes from 1,000 to almost 7,000 or 6,000, going from Switzerland, which actually has a higher GDP per capita than the United States and the United States. Now it's true, the geography is different, all of that plays a role, but look at Kuwait. Kuwait is even smaller than Switzerland. It has a lower GDP than, uh, than the United States, but at a higher energy consumption. And if you go to the Middle East, you know why. They go away for vacation to Europe, leaving their air conditioner full blast on, and the gasoline costs 10 cents a gallon. They'll do it. <laughs> so the, the moral here is that you need to, to bring down on this curve. You need to find out why US uses so much more energy than France or Switzerland. Now solar, can solar work? And uh, I was listening the other day to Weather Channel. In, in this kind of weather, one wants to watch the Weather Channel to see if you, what you should wear tomorrow, if you get out at all. And uh, the lady, Heather Tesh, was saying, well, solar energy couldn't possibly meet the needs of the United States, how wrong she is. The total amount of input from the sun is 69,000 terawatts. Terawatts, the total energy we use in the world is 15 terawatts. Are you telling me 69,000, even with 10% efficiency, will not cover 15, uh, 15 terawatts? Of course it will. Solar intensity, we get about a kilowatt per square meter on a clear day, even in Iowa. And there are about 1,800 to 2,000 hours of sunlight possible. And it's much more so in the Southwest, India, China, Middle East, Australia, Africa. And in the US, a square meter would generate about 2,000 kilowatt hours per, per year. And in parts of India, Africa, Australia, Iran, a square meter would generate 3,000 kilowatt hours per year. And let me show you the solar intensity, I think the next one shows, yeah. The solar intensity atlas of the world, the darker colors is where more solar intensity is. Look at Africa, sub -Sahara, uh, uh, the Sahara and Egypt, and of course, 
Saudi Arabia, Iran, Western India, even Central India is very good, Australia, and uh, Southern Africa, this Kalahari. And the United States is not so shabby. It's only when you go up here that you don't have much sun. But there's an enormous amount of sunlight over most of the, most of the world, certainly over the tropics and not too far from the tropics. Even sometimes even far from the tropics like Southern Africa. What about efficiency of solar use? A direct electric conversion using solar cells, which is my research, generates about 15%. Virtually all of us believe that in 10 to 15 years, we're going to be generating in production at between 20 and 25%. In the laboratory, we already achieved 41%. So we think in production will be around 20 to 25. For heating homes, is, of course, solar energy is extremely efficient and practical today. What about photosynthesis, biofuels? The efficiency is very poor, 0.5 to 1%. So solar electric, average over a year, has a 50 to 1 advantage over photosynthesis in terms of how much area you will need for generating the same, same amount of energy. And it's a major advantage. What about corn-based ethanol? Very poor conversion efficiency, only about half a percent. One joule of input leads at most to 1.4 joule of output. So it's only about 30 or 40 percent gain from solar energy. And the corn-based ethanol will not solve our problems. It's good for reducing pollution. It's bad for solving global warming problems. How about biofuels, waste to ethanol and other types of biofuel? Yes, if handled carefully in terms of replenishing the soil. Corn versus waste. Corn, one joule to 1.4 joule. CO2 is about 12 to 26 percent less. If you use 10 billion gallons, and you'll produce about 10 billion gallons of ethanol. Cellulosic waste uh, or cellulosic conversion into ethanol, in principle, can give you uh, one joule, can give you 10 joules. This is taken from uh, MIT's technology review, this month's uh, edition. And carbon dioxide will be 82 to 85 percent less, and we'll be able to produce 170 billion gallons of ethanol based on the crop waste and, uh, and the wood waste that exists in the United States. And that's almost as much gas as we use today. So corn-based ethanol, uh, so cellulosic is clearly the way to go, and that's why almost all energy companies are rushing into it, and people like Robert Brown are spending a lot of time on it. Corn-based ethanol also has a major moral hazard problem. Has anybody seen the eyes of a starving child? That image never leaves you. So don't tell me that converting food into fuel is a good idea. Corn-based biofuels, here's a law of unintended consequences. The U.S. farmers are planting much more corn, much fewer soybeans. So Brazil says, thank you. They pick up the slack. And what do they do? They, they cut down the Amazon to plant more soybeans. It's the worst possible thing you can do from the viewpoint of carbon cycle because Amazon is the single largest sink for carbon dioxide. What about other biofuels, synthetic biology? both to increase the photosynthetic efficiency and uh, superbugs, so special bacteria which can produce ethanol. And that's the focus of UC Berkeley's program. That's the 500 million BP program at Berkeley. And that is a brilliant idea. That is the future of biofuels that will most likely work. Food-based biofuels will not have a major impact. What about wind? We have 370 terawatts of wind power available worldwide. And it's great for the U.S. Midwest and coastal areas. And indeed, we are building windmills all over the world, and we should be. And this is the wind potential in the world. The dark areas is where the greatest wind potential is. And as you all know, the upper Midwest, Montana, Wyoming, that's where the wind is, and of course the coast. What about storage? Solar and wind are not continuous. That is a problem. There are many methods. Batteries will not work. Absolutely not. Batteries don't store enough energy per kilogram. But two different schemes will. One is a pump storage. It's a very simple idea. You take solar or wind, and you couple it with a pump storage uh, hydroelectric plant. You basically have two reservoirs, one down here, one up on a mountaintop, 1,000 feet up. And you pump water uphill during daytime using the same turbines and the same pipes. 
using solar or wind energy, if you're looking at sun, then solar energy, and flow it downhill to generate electricity. It's an extremely efficient process, about 90% round-trip conversion efficiency, but needs water. It may be a problem in many geographic locations, but not in California or India or parts of Africa, where you have lots of water, like Central Africa. How about chemical conversion? Solar wind, electricity can go into an electrolyzer, electrolysis machine, produce hydrogen from water. Then you store hydrogen used in fuel cells for regenerating electricity. And fuel cells on large area are very efficient. Fuel cells, large fuel cells have been made for at least 30 years. United Technology has been making them. And uh, they're used routinely in, uh, in power plants. They've been proven out in power plants, you know, things like one megawatt type units. Uh, and they are, again, 70% efficient. And fuel cells are coming. Fuel cell cars are coming. Honda just demonstrated a fuel cell car which went 260 miles on a single charge of hydrogen. So fuel cell cars are coming. It looks just like an Accord. Looking at it, you cannot tell the difference between the Honda FCV and the Honda Accord. Or, even better still, make ammonia. Ammonia is just nitrogen plus hydrogen. Get hydrogen, mix it with nitrogen, use ammonia. Why ammonia? Because ammonia can be liquefied very easily. Ammonia and liquids per liter store hell of a lot more energy than gas. Ammonia can be liquefied at only about eight, at eight atmospheres. And this is the, I'll end in a minute or two. So to fuel from the sun, you get either solar or wind electricity, put it through the electrolyzer, get hydrogen, either store hydrogen or make ammonia. And once you have hydrogen, you can run fuel cells or you can use it in a vehicle. Hopefully with fuel cells, not with internal combustion engine, because fuel cells are much more efficient. And fuel cells are coming. Every, every major auto company is working on fuel cells. What about cost of solar electric? The costs are about 20 to 25 cents a kilowatt hour today, and, and coal is about six to seven. You compare with natural gas, which is at 15 cents a kilowatt hour. So in places like California and New York, where higher tariffs exist during peak demand periods, the price can be, price is greater than 25 cents a kilowatt hour. You look up the tariffs of, of Pacific Gas and Electric or Long Island Light, and you'll find high tariffs. Solar is already cheaper than, uh, than uh, natural gas for peak power, already. That's why there are entire developments being built in California, which have solar photovoltaics on the roof. How do we get the cost down? By R&D, using thin films, automated processing, Within five years, we believe we'll be producing at less than 15 cents a kilowatt hour from present 25, and within 10, it'll be 10 cents. This is already a huge industry. It's an $11 billion a year industry growing at about 50% a year, producing two gigawatts a year, equal to two nuclear plants. When was the last nuclear plant built in the United States? The last one ordered was 1977, last built was about 85. We are producing far more solar plants today than nuclear. And uh, another way of reducing costs, use concentrators. Lenses focusing sunlight on solar cells. It's cost competitive today in places like Western India or, or the, uh, the Mojave Desert or Sonoran Desert. And we don't need any government subsidies. The market is huge. It's a great opportunity for an entrepreneur. And here is a diagram of, uh, it's not a solar uh, electric, it's not a solar photovoltaic plant, it's a solar thermal plant. It's being built in Nevada, it's already been built. It's 64 megawatts, and it relies on parabolic trough and a pipe, and you focus energy uh, on the pipe and you produce steam and run a steam generator. There's no subsidy, it's a private plant. So to conclude, Increasing energy utilization and production is not only feasible, but imperative and economical. Sun and wind are both feasible and can provide all of our energy needs. A solar fuel cycle is a critical R&D need, so are biofuels, based on synthetic biology. And the decreasing cost of solar power is the third critical R&D need. And to give you an example, our beloved Congress in its latest reconciliation, budget reconciliation bill, it was so anxious to promote renewable energy and to address global warming program that it zeroed out solar energy research budget. Zero. All right.
right. Now, for those of you with questions, you can start lining up over there at that microphone in the center aisle, and we'll ask our panelists to come on up here. And all right, thanks. All right, go ahead. The community, your question is a very good one. I haven't studied the Marshalltown coal plant, and uh, I guess I should, uh, and I will. I would hope that the plant is large, I believe it's a large enough plant, it's a six or 700 megawatt plant. And uh, so I'm hoping that they're using the best possible efficiency. I'm hoping their efficiency is greater than 40%. If it's less than that, I'll certainly oppose it. Because the Marshalltown community, I'm not against coal burning power plants. I'm against low efficiency coal burning power plants. So the Marshalltown community doesn't know the difference between the two of them. And, uh, but the utility certainly does, and it's up to people like us to make sure that the Iowa Regulatory Commission addresses the efficiency problem. The Alliant Energy people say it's a 40% plant, but it's not going to replace the old plant, which is about 32%. So again, the power plants may replace what we have now. Ames power plant is very small, so um, I doubt that they could get the large efficiency in Ames power plant using uh, using coal. They should really go for natural gas. Hi, this question uh, goes to Dr. Buckley. Um, during your presentation, you had mentioned, uh, regardless of the actions we take today, um, we're committed to a warming of temperatures over the next 50 years. Um, I want to know what kind of impacts is that going to have on the polar ice caps melting if they're already melting at a faster rate now than we've already predicted mm -hmm. if we've got this 50 year commitment to the temperature? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a very good question. There was a study, a National Academy of Science study, uh, headed by Robert Carell. Uh, that was published about four years ago, and and they had projected that the Arctic would be ice-free by 2100, and it looks like it's happening much faster than that. So, uh, you know, the climate scientists have been criticized because their models uh, aren't explaining everything, and uh, one of the things that we don't explain is some of these positive, what we call positive feedbacks, that is these runaway sort of of uh, events, and that's kind of what's happening with the Arctic is that you melt some ice and you get more open water, which absorbs more energy, which then melts more ice, which absorbs more you know, more open water and absorbs more energy. So um, the models w were very conservative that they used in in those projections. So um, I think now with, with what's happened in 2007, uh, it's really been an eye-opener and people are going to be really watching what's going to happen in uh, this present year, this present summer. Is that really true? 
No, it wouldn't. Uh, I mean, it, temperatures are going to go up as carbon dioxide goes up. I mean, we can uh, we understand that. We look at. I mean, we you could we could uh, take Venus as an example. They have a lot of carbon dioxide. And the surface temperature is five hundred degrees. Uh, fair. Yeah, I mean it's it's five hundred degrees uh, Celsius or something like that. So we know there's a relationship. The more carbon dioxide you have, the more greenhouse uh, effect there is, and and the hotter the surface gets. I don't know if there's an upper limit, but 400 isn't it, and 4,000 probably isn't it either. You know, I don't know the answer to the problem. Uh, certainly, corrosion would be a problem, but on the other hand, they use seawater for cooling nuclear power plants, so they must have solved that problem. But I don't know the answer to that problem. Yes, if seawater is available, that would be great. You don't worry about your operation. But if you're going to put it in a the desert, then you do worry about loss of water. Because water, actually, water shortage is going to be a worse problem than energy shortage. I might just comment. I actually visited uh, a big one in uh, south of Hangzhou in China a couple years ago. And uh, that was in the middle of the country in a more humid area. But uh, I think it was generating uh, about a megawatt uh, uh, of capacity. Uh, I think the biggest one is someplace in California. But uh, it you know, looked like a system that really uh, worked very effectively. Although the efficiency on them, I think, is only about 60, 65 percent from what I was able to uh, determine. I mean, they use the period of low power to pump the water back up, and then when the high peak demand is, they're pumping it down or letting it come down around the generators. I was wondering if any of you gentlemen have done any extensive research pertaining to cellulosic ethanol and specifically switchgrass and how likely that will I haven't, but uh, you know you should ask Robert Brown that question. And uh, but the latest technology review, the MIT publication, comes out every month. Uh, specifically talks about switchgrass. And uh, don't quote me on this, but my memory says that uh, from that article that there is more than enough switchgrass available in the United States to produce significant amounts of ethanol, far larger than corn-based ethanol. And I just just go to the library and read it. I mean, I got my, my issue last week. The library may not still have it, but it's there. I've also heard that I was become a corn importer since we started building all of these ethanol plants. And we're starting to take land out of CRP and things along those lines and planting corn in increasing environmental degradation. And if we were to plant switchgrass on that, even though it is a monoculture, would that be obviously much better than corn? And how much better do you guys think that would be? Um, I've looked at this issue from an economic point of view. Uh, right now, uh, unless it's really poor land, uh, switchgrass can't hold a candle to corn. Uh, <clears throat> for one thing, corn produces about four tons of grain an acre and produces another four tons of two of which is harvestable, usually, of biomass in the process. Uh, and so that really puts some constraints on. You can get switchgrass up there, but you've got two crops coming off of corn, essentially. Whereas switchgrass, you, you know, getting four tons an acre would be a real task here, and you'd have to probably be going to some fertilization to get there. Uh, so I'm not sure that we're ever going to see much switchgrass, except maybe in some of the hills in southern Iowa. And... Um, there's a lot of controversy. I'm working on a panel on America's energy future dealing with alternative liquid fuels right now. Uh, and it's really interesting because uh, some of the people who are really players in this game are not very optimistic about switchgrass. Uh, Miscanthus uh, has some really good uh, indications coming down the road. One of the problems you've got with switchgrass 
is that there's a something called delayed dormancy. So you're spending four years getting that up to uh, uh, a level of full production. First couple of years, there's very little harvest off it. And the opportunity cost of tying the land up in that, particularly if it's better land, is just too high. I mean, right now, I think they figure about $250 an acre net returns off corn. Um, and uh, the other side of this is that's really a challenge with biomass is the cost of harvesting, storing, and transporting that. And we're running estimates from some of the work we're doing of probably a dollar to a dollar fifty a gallon with current conversion technology for those that phase. And so it's awfully hard to make that work. Um, if you go into the process of fertilizing more to get higher yields, then the greenhouse gas savings go down dramatically. So we're, we're working on it. I mean, I'd love to see it work, but it's awfully hard uh, to show the economics of it uh, as being very viable. I, I have seen nothing that would say we're anywhere close to having enough switchgrass to begin to match what we produce from corn. Uh, yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Question for Dr. Marinowski. In an optimal cap and trade system, Okay, um, two things. One is that is somewhat the concern of industry is that the government's going to c continually move that cap down or tighten that cap up. Uh, but at the same time, you've got the incentives once you're paying for carbon to start looking for new technologies that are much more carbon efficient. And I don't think it's all going to take place in the production of the energy or power, where I see a lot more of it coming is going to be in capture. Uh, pumping it down into oil wells, which we've done historically to force uh, residual oil up. Uh, one of the best places to do it is in saline aquifers uh, on the sea floor and so forth, because then you create a chemical reaction that ties it up and it's uh, not a problem any longer. So I think we're going to be looking at some of those as opposed to trying to find technologies to mitigate it. Uh, clean coal is another technology that I see coming down the road. So I think what's going to happen is the new plants coming on are going to be much more efficient. And uh, they'll probably have to go in and buy permits for the level that they're up there, which is going to raise the permit price for everybody if we want more uh, energy that's carbon producing. What is the, uh, the next step that we can demand of our politicians to make our uh, cap-and-trade system work in the U.S.? Uh, I think one of the things is that it's got to be one of the concerns that a lot of econ economists have, have expressed is that if we try to run cap-and-trade, include everybody or at least a large segment. Uh, I was talking with somebody the other day. I think if we... Uh, brought in the top 15 percent of carbon emitters, uh, maybe even be less than that, maybe 15,000 carbon emitters in the country, we could reduce uh, about 85 percent or gain about 85 percent of the carbon reduction from that. So I mean that would be power plants, uh, refineries, and so forth. And the thing is, if you can do it at that level, then you make the price of high carbon material a lot higher. And so then you force substitutes or you encourage substitutes, you provide incentives to get substitutes in there for those types of uh, products. And so I think the system uh, would be, you know, very workable as long as we don't try to make it too broad. If we do, you know, it's a little like uh, livestock water quality regulations or the old CAFOs that came about in 1972. They let uh, they excluded all small operations, and I think it's the kind of thing here that if you focus on the big ones, you'll capture most of the benefits or potential benefits. This is kind of in response to the first question. Uh, 
first question, I'm Jim Popkin, I'm on the same city council. And uh, one of the things uh, is that we're probably gonna be making decisions on power plants here uh, in the next year, as far as some direction to go. And uh, we have a lot of expertise up there and in this room. And I guess one of the requests I have is that we have an opening on our utilities board, or your app board <laughs> here. And if anybody would like to apply for that, because uh, we're struggling with, with what kind of direction to go in. And what's, what's going on? So I, I you know, certainly invite anybody to, to do that. Their, their application is due February eighth, but we, we certainly <laughs> like to help. I'm just curious about one technology that I didn't hear mentioned, and that is uh, using the carbon that comes from coal plants to grow algae as a source of biomass. Is there any utility to that? Idea? You want to take it? Go ahead. I don't know much about it. So, I mean, I, I know algae is photosynthetically much more efficient at converting solar energy into uh, fuels. But, uh, yeah, I, I've seen things about, you know, using iron tailings and whatnot and to, to make the I, I, algae grow faster. The question always comes up, what about the water? Where is the water? And uh, unless you want to pollute the Great Lakes with it, which I don't think is a brilliant idea, uh, where is the water? And uh, the other idea I've heard about is that uh, you can grow some algae, which grows very well in saline water, and then off the coast of California, you can grow a lot of it. But again, I haven't studied it. I haven't paid too much attention, so I'm really not qualified to judge it. But maybe somebody else is. One of the big fixes, that early big fixes that was suggest and by the way if you're interested in some climate big fixes just do a google on climate big fixes and you'll get some interesting results uh, but one of them was early 10 12 years ago was to fertilize the polar oceans with iron to stimulate phytoplankton growth uh, because it'll, the the polar oceans have a lot of phytoplankton which are starved for iron, and if you sprinkle some iron on it, you can get this huge bloom in the spring, southern hemisphere, northern hemisphere, whichever, in the spring of the year. And uh, so that was one of the early uh, big fixes, which uh, would work, and they did some little experiments, and it really does work, but again, with any of this kind of geoengineering, you, you have to consider the consequences, and my ecology friends get nervous about uh, that what happens then in terms of the oxygen balance in the in the uh, vertical uh, profile in the in the polar oceans and what uh, what needs oxygen and what doesn't? We have already have a hypoxic zone in the Gulf. <coughs> practices that all of us need to be aware of. We're all, I think, getting flooded by emails for support this, support 25 by 25, support 20 by 50. So we're getting flooded with a lot of these things, but one place that we can help create a safe political space or political will, as everybody here has talked about there being a lack of, is if we can weigh in a little bit on what direction we think makes the best sense. And so I'm wondering if each of you could maybe put out one or two ideas of what, what do you see as our steps now that we can talk to our Congress people about what's that best, best mix of whether it's taxation or incentive or cap and trade or how we might want to do that. That makes sense? Right. Um, I guess I would start by saying economically I would probably do it cap and trade or taxes. I think cap and trade is much more feasible because you're setting a limit on carbon or greenhouse gas emissions uh, as opposed to imposing a tax on the industry. Uh, the Im impact, as my little graph was supposed to show, should be the same. And uh, I think the big issue is, are we going to get our political actors to put a tight enough cap on to get us where we want to get? 
At the same time, though, as one of the other questioners raised the point, uh, we can continue to tighten the cap. And I do think a gradual tightening of that cap, particularly uh, in early years and a faster one later, probably makes a lot more sense because it gives the economy and the system a chance to adjust. Uh, but I think if we use a cap, uh, I'm a little bit nervous about putting too many other restrictions on the system. I'm not opposed to greater efficiency ratings for automobiles. But I agree with Professor Dalal that it really troubles me uh, because we don't make a lot of fast progress by going a half a mile a year, a mile a year with efficiency ratings. And you know we should have included SUVs and trucks from day one as opposed to bringing them in after the fact now. So I guess that's why I don't have a lot of confidence in the regulatory structure. I, I think it's just a way of bringing this along a little faster, but I would like to see the market drive that and I think higher prices are going to drive it. I mean, if there are higher prices out there for fuel, that hybrid's going to look a lot better with 50% efficiency uh, than the car that's got another mile a gallon over the one last year. And even some of these other technologies, I mean, I see hydrogen as a ways off uh, in some of these other technologies. At the same time, though, we've got to be moving in that direction. And what's going to give people a bigger impetus to try it than if they're really saving some real dollars? and the process. Yeah, uh, I wanted to address something about the tax and uh, how much money do you think we are spending, we are sending per day because of oil imports? What is the tax on us that we are sending out to Russia, Venezuela, and Saudi Arabia? Make a guess. One billion dollars a day. So that's $360 billion a year. We use 170, 150 billion gallons of gasoline per year. We are paying $1.25 a gallon in tax to Saudi Arabia. What kind of idiots are we? Supposing we increase our gasoline tax by $1.25 a gallon, kept it here, and gave an incentive to General Motors to make hybrid cars. Would that not make sense? We are complete idiots, and our politicians are even worse. Um, I think the issue really boils down to the following. Right now, we don't have any good options for alternative liquid transportation fuels outside of ethanol. In a few years, five years, ten years, we may. But right now, we don't have a good alternative. And, you know, from an economic point of view, or an energy point of view, I would never go the ethanol route because we're only getting about 67, 70 percent of the energy value out of a gallon of ethanol that we do out of a gas, gallon of gasoline. So we've got to produce a lot more ethanol. I mean, we produce, you know, I think the target for 2020 is 15 billion gallons, I mean, uh, a billion gallons of ethanol out of the 36. But that's only 10 billion gallons of gasoline. And as Vikram was saying, uh, we're consuming 150 uh, billion gallons of gasoline a year. Well, not quite there yet, but we're in the 140s now, and fast going to 150. So we're not buying a whole lot with it. I think if we get to 36 billion gallons of biofuels, if that's all ethanol, that's still only 24 billion gallons of gasoline. And so I think, you know, we had a technology. The technology was well understood. And so that was the route we went. But I think over the long haul, it's, that's not going to be the main route. What I see, though, is that there's some, I don't think the ethanol industry is going to go away. 
Uh, it's a transition fuel, but once it's established, it'll become more efficient. It may also, uh, you know, shift or transition to some kind of a thermochemical process. Um, and so we're making something that's comparable to gasoline and energy value. If you look at what BP is trying to do, they want to use butanol. That's about 98, 99 percent of the energy value that gasoline has. And so that alone would be just a tremendous gain. Uh, you know, it would be about a 50 percent improvement in the fuel value of uh, going that way. But there's nothing saying we can't retrofit uh, our ethanol plants in that way. Or another thing we're seeing is that we're probably going to see more ethanol plants going, I mean, um, also becoming joint ventures with the biomass plants, I mean the corn ethanol plants. Because you can't afford, I was telling you the cost of trans, or what our estimates are for the cost of harvesting, storing, and transporting biomass. You can't, that system isn't going to work to transport it more than 30 miles. And what we're seeing, I think we're going to see, is a much more distributed production system where we do a primary processing uh, to produce sometimes referred to as dirty oil or bio oil, which will then be much more transportable and concentrated to send to uh, refineries or bio refineries to make into a fuel comparable to gasoline. And so, but I don't think it's, we're going to see the local ethanol plant disappear. Uh, I don't anticipate, particularly now with the mandates on uh, in the new Energy uh, Investment and Security Act, there's, you know, it's not going to go away. I've got two questions. Uh, the first is, have you looked at the comparative efficiency of rail to automobiles and trucks for transporting passengers and, uh, and freight? And uh, why haven't, uh, it probably political will here is needed, but it seems to me that converting that uh, function to, to rail might be another way of reducing our dependence on, on uh, oil. The other question I have is that at least two of you referred to the risk of catastrophe. But you didn't say what that catastrophe was. Are you afraid of scaring us to death? Or <laughs> let me take the transportation and I'll let Gene answer about catastrophe. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the bad news guy. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, rail traffic is t about 10 times more efficient at moving a ton of 10 times less energy per ton mile than truck. That's why you see all of the uh, trucks piggybacking onto rails for long distance transport. They're not stupid. At uh, three dollars a gallon uh, does, uh, diesel or 325, they know what their costs are. So that's why they are piggybacking on the rails. As far as passenger transport, Ginny's out of the bottle. You're not going to put it back. United States grew on the basis of unlimited mobility. That's how our population distribution has become and we're not going to put it back. That doesn't mean that in, for urban transport, rail systems don't work. They obviously do in New York City and Washington. I mean, ever since the Washington got the metro, life has become so much easier out there. And, uh, but you're not going to get rail transport in Iowa. Come on, get, get or you know, Chicago has it, not, not particularly efficient. But uh, we have grown. The United States has grown on the basis of unlimited mobility and highways. And you're, not, you're not going to reverse that trend. Also, you're not going to re reverse that trend with $3 gasoline or lower. No. no. I At mean, $10 you, know, you might. But yeah, $10 you know, may change patterns. Yeah. The other thing is the rail has become extremely important, but also bottlenecked by uh, trying to transport all this ethanol to the coast. Yep. Yeah. Uh, and so we've got big needs for probably expansion in that area in the future. That's why Warren Buffett is buying railroads. <laughs> He's not stupid. <laughs> with, with regard to the... Warren Buffett is buying... Yeah, yeah I'm talking. Okay. Uh, with regard to the catastrophes, uh, two are, are, are mentioned, at least that I've seen, uh, and the, the, both of them relate to sea level rise. Uh, one is the is the melting of uh, Greenland, and I showed how that's accelerated dramatically 
uh, recently. That'll lead to substantial sea level rise. Melting of polar ice, of course, doesn't lead to a lot of sea level rise because it, you know if you it, it's just displacing uh, water. So I mean, water displacing where the ice was, but. But if it's Greenland ice, then you have a problem. And, and Jim Hansen has, has projected that if, we, if our energy imbalance reaches one watt per square meter, that would set in place the irreversible loss of all of the ice on Greenland. One watt per square meter. And we are presently at 0.7. We went from zero to 0 0.7 between 1975 and 2007. So, um, if you if you project that out, and if I had my uh, uh, the, the slides all showed up, it would have sh I would have shown that if you project that out, it's 2018 at our present uh, uh, use of energy. Now that's that's his that's his projection, and that isn't that in 2018 the whole Greenland ice sheet would collapse. It would take hundreds of years. The other uh, catastrophe is the break off of the West Antarctic ice sheet, which would uh, raise sea level um, probably within a week by about 20 feet. Uh, that'd that'd be pretty catastrophic for maybe not for Iowa immediately, but uh, if you look at where people live, you look at the population of the planet that lives within 20 feet uh, elevation of sea level, you know, you just go around the U.S. and go around uh, Europe and India and, and so on, uh, where the population centers are, you know that it would be catastrophic. So those are the two that are mentioned. Uh, the, and the, the, there is evidence of the, that the West Antarctic ice sheet is, is moving and, and uh, disintegrating faster, much faster than we thought. I, I, I don't know the details on how long that might take. Yeah, and if I can just add something in terms of its impact, consider Bangladesh. The average elevation is 20 feet. I mean, it's, it's the Gangetic Delta, the Gangetic and Brahmaputra Delta. It's virtually flat land. As it is, every time a cyclone comes by, the waters go 50 miles inland from the sea and drown 30,000 people. I mean, that happens every year. What would happen if the sea level were to rise by 20 feet? You're looking at 150 million people going underwater. I have a two-part question. Uh, one is, can you use uh, geothermal energy to create uh, electric power? And the second is, well, even 100% efficient coal-burning power plant will produce carbon dioxide. And uh, companies are studying uh, sequestering carbon dioxide by compressing it pumping it underground 3,000 feet. Do you think that's possible? The answer to both questions is yes. California already has Chevron. has a big uh, geothermal plant in California. produces hundreds of megawatts. I've forgotten exactly how much. And uh, probably six, 700 megawatts. And uh, yes, wherever the terrain on the earth is appropriate, Iceland, uh, Western United States, Yes, geothermal is a terrific way of producing energy, and uh, as the price of oil and natural gas becomes larger and larger, more and more geothermal energy will be utilized. On your second question of carbon sequestration, yes, we have enough caverns and enough underground, both in coal mines and in uh, natural gas fields and oil fields. I mean, after all, we have, we have depleted our oil reservoirs, basically. And we are now using secondary and tertiary recovery to get the, as much of the oil out from, from West Texas fields as we can. And uh, so burning coal there and, and using carbon dioxide, pumping it down to get even more oil out, that's a perfectly feasible approach. And there is a large utility in eastern United States, American Electric Power, and I've forgotten exactly where they're doing it. I want to say West Virginia, but it may be Kentucky. Uh, they are actually trying, they're going to have a pilot plant of small power plants, small coal burning power plant, but they're going to try to use uh, carbon sequestration and see how well the technology works. It still has not been demonstrated on a commercial scale, but again, it's not going to require a Nobel Prize to do that.
I want to read a, a couple lines from uh, uh, a technical paper entitled the, the Myth of Nitrogen Fertilization for Soil Carbon Sequestration. And uh, the author says that uh, maximizing the economic productivity of crop production while minimizing microbial oxidation of r residue carbon and native soil organic carbon it is extremely important. A strategy merits serious consideration because soils hold more than twice as much carbon as the atmosphere and even a minor change in terrestrial carbon dioxide balance could have a significant global impact. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, do you have any comments to offer towards that? Yeah, the, the, uh, we've, we've burned out about half of the carbon out of our agricultural soils in the, in the, uh, great, in the Midwest. And I did a calculation years ago, and I think it was something, if we could, if we could increase soil carbon like 2% per year, we could clean up after ourselves in the state of Iowa. Um, but that's a tough job. I mean, you talk to a you talk to a soil chemist, and you'd say, "Ah, you can store two percent, can't you?" And that's that's a very tall order on an on an average basis. Now, there is an attempt. In fact, we have one of our scientists uh, in the agronomy department who is um, thinks that he can thicken the cell walls of a plant's roots enough to keep it keep the microbes out to keep it from decaying. Now that'd be terrific. Uh, so, you know, that's what we have to be doing. We have to be looking at, at these kind of possibilities. But uh, it seems to me everything's on the table. Um, but carbon dioxide, uh, you know, carbon will get away from you if you, if, if you put it, you know, if it gets wet, and, you know, it starts to get some microbes working on it and, and uh, then they create carbon dioxide. There, there are a couple other things I might just mention, Duane. Um, one is we've tried to look a little bit, or some of my colleagues have at least, at carbon sequestration as a program to capture it. And that's essentially what the Farm Bureau is consolidating uh, carbon credits with, with it is. One, a couple things, though, that I think we've got to be very cautious of. One is there's quite a bit of variability. Two, there's so, there are some limits, uh, particularly to the top, one, what, one foot or so, Gene, I think, where you can really sequester a lot. And then beyond that, there may be some kind of equilibrium level where you're not going to capture a lot more. And you can't disturb it. Mm -hmm. Because if you come along and you keep it no-till for 10 years and you plow it, bingo, you've lost everything. And so um, I, I have some real concerns, and this is one thing that people have been trying to figure out, is how could you run such a program that if a farmer at some point t t uh, broke up the soil, how do you, do you get him to pay it all back? Good luck. Uh, so I think it's going to be something that you literally have to put it into some kind of a retirement. And uh, you know, even if we, we were talking earlier about harvesting switchgrass off this land, you got to be very careful there because you end up with a new equilibrium where you're probably going to need to use more nutrients again, and I don't know if you're going to have any net gain. We kept you a little longer than planned, but I think it was well worth it. Uh, have a safe drive home or walk, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs>